Um, bom, como uh, já foi mencionado, acho que podemos iniciar então o período de debate e discussão. Uh, as questões podem ser colocadas em, em português ou em inglês, como preferirem. Uh, enfim, podem dirigi las uh, a alguns dos, dos oradores ou, ou à mesa em geral. Depois alocamos aqui as questões como, como for preferível. Portanto, uh, dava a palavra uh, à assistência para colocar as questões que, que atenderam. Um, uh, o meu nome é... My name is Sarah. Um, I have been a, a pharmacist uh, since uh, 1992. Um, I have uh, a lot of the uh, precarious jobs, uh, six months contracts, and uh, uh, the last uh, last one was uh, more uh, with a, a bigger contract. But uh, I, I think I, lot, I had a lot of crapping crapping jobs like you said, uh, because I was, I was uh, doing a, f um, a graduation in a, a field that I liked in, uh, 19, in 2005, uh, but uh, I, I had to choose. I only I had to choose to or work or, uh, or doing my, my uh, master and uh, I uh, because in that time here in Portugal, uh, the social uh, uh, university services, uh, they, they didn't found the, the, the masters, simply. So I, 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 I had to, to stay in the crapping job. <laughs> crapping is the same thing, it's the same, you say. Uh, so, and you know, uh, uh, sometimes uh, I, I have the, the ideality to, to doing something that I liked, but uh, it's only uh, a dream because uh, suddenly I, had, I, have to, I have to return to the, to the, the first crapping job <laughs> because, I, because simply I need the money. <laughs> so uh, my question is, uh, uh, it's not a question, it's uh, uh, my, uh, what I think about uh, the, the theme in the, in the deba debate today that is the basic income it's uh, it's very well because uh, <laughs> it's very well for <laughs> uh, for the uh, investing in people uh, investing uh, the people uh, can be improve uh, their, uh, their, their possibilities in em in employment and uh, in uh, in uh, in the life because the life uh, pass pass very soon and um, I, have, I have one question to the, the Finnish speaker uh, because uh, I, I was, it was pity because I, I didn't listen to your uh, exposition. Uh, but uh, if you can explain uh, how is uh, uh, the difference between uh, the Finnish system and the Portuguese system. Uh, in, in the moment, in a briefly, <laughs> or something in, in this, for instance, in this, situ in this, in my situation, I will uh, uh, thanks you. Uh, thanks to all. Uh, my name is Marta Garcia Murillo. I'm a professor at Syracuse University. And uh, my question to you, which I haven't really heard on this topic of basic income, is what's your belief about giving a basic income to people who suffer from addictions? Uh, and potentially also people who have, let's say, criminal, uh, who have committed criminal activities. I have a small question to Roberto and Sara, and, and uh, my impression is that uh, uh, basic income is mainly for the middle class. It's a good idea for the middle class. Uh, 
Hi, my name is Leah, and I'm actually a, a big fan of basic income. But every time I talk about it with other people, they always say, oh, but that's going to make people to stop working. And my question is, how, how should we address this? So, because it's very cultural, and we, 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 we have a lot of problems with people having uh, help uh, with, with uh, giving the government giving money. So how should we stop people to think like that and how we should address this? Hello, uh, I'm Ricardo. I, uh, uh, I wanted to, to, to talk to you about, uh, well, there's a lot of uh, uh, basic income models and basic income philosophies uh, that uh, we can see in debate in this room as well. So that's very interesting for me to see where different people come from different uh, backgrounds and different uh, uh, minds and, and propose different models for the same thing. And that's, that, I think, it's, if, it's very interesting. But the thing is, I can only see one working, which is the liberal, or, or the, other, the, the only one that I really understand is the rib, uh, liberal way of, uh, of addressing it. Like, okay, so instead of, uh, of a welfare state, you'll have some money, and the state will give you some money, and will strip away everything else, and that will be something that uh, you, you can work with, and you'll have to, well, instead of uh, uh, a health uh, system, a national health system, you'll have some money to do that within the market. So I'm very interested in what you've said about it, uh, this model can take us out of the markets uh, with uh, Nesping Anderson's uh, approach, right? Because it takes us out, it defends us from the labor market, but then, in a liberal way, it puts us in uh, an undefensive uh, way in the market because you'll have to find uh, someone for, uh, to get your, uh, some schools and uh, some clinics and everything else that now the labor market puts, uh, the, 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 the welfare state puts in place for you. So my question is, I can understand that model, but I can't understand other models of uh, uh, UBI I can't understand the progressive model of, of UBI, and my question is, why do we need money to do it? If we are all keen in, well, we can do all of that thing without putting the market into the, the, the equation, why do we have to use money to do that, and why don't we extend the, the welfare state instead of giving people money to do that? Uh, I'm not sure if I'm uh, making myself clear, but why don't we amplify uh, uh, the, the welfare state so that people don't need money to have basic needs. We can go as, as, uh, as uh, uh, the length of uh, uh, providing food for everyone, a shelter and everything, but without the mediation of money. If that's our goal, why do we need money to do it? Can I? Can I, teacher? I have one question myself. Uh, how can we get the money to, to pay it? And if it will not increase the nationalism movements we are seeing? Because Jürgen spoke about the robots, and the Japanese people is speaking about the UBI for some several years, and they have the capacity, for example, being a high industrialized country, to tax the robots and get the revenue necessary, for example, to implement this. But since uh, some of you spoke about the migrants' problem, what will happen is that if you don't close your country, you will not have the money to, fi to financiate this question. If you will not need to, to close your country and try to solve it, because I can see that some countries, for example, the northern countries of the Europe, for example, Norway has oil, the Swedish have oil, you have much better chances to find the revenue to implement it, and I don't see how countries in the south of Europe, like Portugal, we have a, a lot of debt, uh, how can we find a way if, if, 
if it is not an utopia for you, I think it is an utopia for other countries like mine. Thank you. Let's go ahead. Um, you, okay. Uh, which prefers to start? Professor Jurgen? Oli? Oli? Oli can start okay. by replying to the questions. Yes. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. Thank you for questions. Uh, if I start with that uh, difference between the Portu Portuguese and the Finnish system, uh, I don't know that much about the Portuguese system, but uh, uh, I'll tell you about the Finnish system so that you can put in the context. And somehow I think that it's perhaps an answer to some other questions. So in Finland we have a dual system so that we have basic security for all. And we very much uh, use people's insurance and it's uh, basic and it's universal and everybody is uh, included in the, the social security, the basic social security. And it doesn't make a difference whatsoever between a citizen and uh, immigrants. So that uh, everything is residence based. And for example, in our uh, experiment that we are here, uh, just now having, we have the Russians, we have the Estonians, we have Germans, we have people from Turkey, and we don't know uh, who the people are, but uh, it's based on residence, not based on citizens, citizenship. So that's, a, that's one, one thing. And then uh, there was <coughs> then, uh, discussion about the, <coughs> the, the pay, uh, partial basic income, and uh, just to take an example from Finland. I think that pay, uh, partial basic income will solve uh, lots of bureaucratic problems. Uh, for example, if you have a guy who is uh, unemployed, then uh, she falls sick uh, and she must apply for sickness benefit. And in between, she's without money, she runs to the uh, social assistance bureau. And then uh, she gets uh, healthy again and then she runs to the employment office and says that I'm fit to work and willing to work and then she must get something that's called a labor market certification that she is fit and can be used in the labor markets. And once again it takes a couple of weeks and she runs in the social assistance bureau to get that money. And finally enough, all those benefits are paid out by social insurance institution Kela. So that in my mind, it's totally waste of time or that client and waste of time bureaucrats like me to handle all those applications. So that we would make it much easier for, let's say, one million per people in Finland to merge them together. And not to call it uh, basic income because it's uh, controversial and the social democrats will kill us and the trade unions will be behind us and uh, hit in our heads in the darkness. So that let's call it, uh, uh, let's say, basic security, kill us basic security. That's totally legitimate and that's totally uh, uh, acceptable. And uh, somehow then we could take that basic income idea through the kitchen door uh, to, to the agenda. Uh, and then uh, if people stop working, there are very strong arguments and very, very little evidence what will happen. And I hope that all that those uh, experiments that we are having uh, in Finland, that we are having in the Netherlands, that we, we are having in Canada, will produce some, some evidence to this, so that it's not only uh, arguments, uh, both feet are firmly in the air. Um. Trying to think which one I want to answer. <laughs> so, uh, I'll take the first one. So addiction and uh, you know, should we give basic income to people who are addicted and criminals? Um, so I'm all. I, I mean, to be honest, I get pretty pissed off whenever people put that point to me because one 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 of the things of a basic income fundamentally, fundamentally. Basic income is a philosophy that means that we put a little bit of trust in people. Okay, you just have to accept that. I mean, I mean that's really what it's all about. It's a, it's a policy that basically says, look, we can we can do it two different ways. We can control, 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 and monitor and control, 
And we've got a lot of track records that that doesn't necessarily work all that great, right? Or we can trust a bit. And with trust comes the fact that we're going to have to accept that certain things go wrong. Policy is not perfect. Basic income will never be perfect, okay? So here is one thing, and, and this is the, and I'll try and keep it short, but uh, this, I, I've taught basic income to philosophy students. So here is what I tell my students. So imagine that you have a policy like basic income. And let's say that, let's give it a percentage. Let's say that 1% of people will increase addiction and there'll be 2% people more crime, okay? Let's say that at the same time, the same policy, we have evidence that it decreases child poverty with, let's say 3%. Let's make the numbers the same, whatever. So you want to bang on, and I'm not saying you, I mean, you know, uh, you want to bang on about the addicted and, uh, you know, and uh, the prisoners and the criminals. So, so how many children are you willing to trade off for your, you know, for controlling the addicted person? Like, so, you know, and, you know, and imagine, imagine that we find evidence, as we've done, for example, in unconditional cash transfers, right? Imagine that this actually even saves lives, you know? You know, it's not just about you know, relinquishing. So how many children are you willing to sacrifice just to make sure that your little addicted person does not get a bit more addicted, right? So, sure, there might be other ways, and why haven't we figured them out yet? I mean, there may be so many different ways. This is what people keep telling us. Basic income is a bad idea. We should do other stuff. Then bloody well do the other stuff. And if you don't, then let's think about basic income as a serious thing, pros and cons, and let's examine it. What Oli is saying, let's get evidence in there as well. Right? Yeah. Can I just uh, add something? Sorry, sorry for the swearing. But <laughs> I just want to say that that's one of the things that the pilot programs test, if it uh, uh, decreases that problem or not. I mean, the pilot programs are limited, but that's one of the things that you can, with the medical uh, that you said in Finland, you just, you, you don't even have to ask the people directly. You can go to their medical records and see if it's helping or not helping. So, you know, anyway. Okay, I'll, uh, I'll try to answer two or three, mostly with a broad answer rather than a specific. And it's really the question about basic income, precarity, community state. So a bit of the provocation, I think, from the gentleman in the back. Why do the only basic income is a neoliberal basic income? You call it liberal, but you know, let's call it neoliberal. And, and it's, I think you were making it as a straw man to say we don't want this. Um, I think the... Uh, that's what I guessed, unless you were, you know, but uh, yeah. I think there's two issues there. First, we don't live in a world without cash, but cash doesn't have to be universal cash. Sorry to use anthropological terms. What we need to I, I have an idea is the money has to have some boundaries. So there are some areas of life that can be monetized and some that don't. As long as we oppose that principle, then it makes sense to have a basic income in a progressive perspective. I, you need to take care of those areas of life within a social democratic system where you do need cash to work more or less efficiently you know, in capitalist terms, in some kind of capital. But of course, longer term, if you're against capitalism, that's fine. I mean, then you want to abolish cash in that way. I think we're still not at the stage, but I'm not against that in principle. It's just about pragmatics. I think now we're fighting a real struggle on the ground, whether we're going all neoliberal or we're going to be able to recuperate social democracy in a more global perspective. So I'm more on this side and trying to fight the struggle there. The other problem is work. One of the main things, and I think it comes very well from the Finnish example, and even though it was my technocratic critique, I actually very much like the model, because it shows what the problem is. And in, while in Finland there's still a minority, in Portugal and Italy that's the majority. People who are moving on and off the benefit trap where giving them a secure payment gives them a huge advantage. So the question here is not to be ideological about it. The Finnish unions are right in wanting to confine that to certain things because you don't want 560 euros to replace 1,000 euros, 1,500 euros, which are the union benefits. So my, quite, my point there is that until we have these large numbers of people, the informal economy, the underemployed, were excluded by the current union model, we need to negotiate for some redistribution, which is not breaking the unions, but it's the idea that we need to redistribute what's there to help everybody. So that's the issue of precarity. Finally, on the state, and it goes back to the point there, 
we need to have communities, we need to have public spaces, we need to have functioning hospitals. That's what will help the experience of precarity that the woman at the beginning, the lady at the beginning talked about. You don't want to lose all that. That's why it's so important to fight against the liberal version of basic income. We cannot use it as a Trojan horse. We want community, we want some amount of cash to help people living in healthy communities. Ultimately, that's the goal. Final on the migrant issues, of course, from the perspective of each single state, Portugal is losing versus Germany, but it's already taken a lot from Angola. Italy loses against UK, but we have oil in Libya. So the question is, we can all go and closing ourselves and have these enclosures, we lose solidarity. So nobody will care about the Portuguese, uh, the Italians won't care about the Libyans, the Libyans won't care about the British. Uh, that is basically where we're going. So we need to, that's why I'm being quite strict on that, already conversing in that sense, erases all these inequalities. If we want north-south redistribution, we need to understand that each of us is discriminated and exploits other discrimination in different ways. That's where the basis for solidarity is, and that's why we can't close borders. Do you wish to... Very quickly, it's not for the bourgeois, of course, it's, for, it's universal. But I was reading the other day a paper from Tony Negri. He was commenting on basic income and Benoit Hamon. He favored Benoit Hamon. He lives in Paris. His wife is French. And uh, he was saying that for him, basic income is really a way to create a communist ethos. So you should have a look at that paper. It's quite fascinating. Thanks. Uh, can I ask a question for, to the audience? Well, <laughs> if you don't mind. Uh, because uh, after these presentations, they were quite useful, and well, I appreciate this to you. Um, but uh, it, it seems that there are basically two, two different models that we can see here. One, uh, uh, the, this perspective of the basic income as a full basic income, and this is probably the radical view uh, and also the liberal view of the basic income where we have a, a new benefit that will replace all other um, social security benefits. It, it will replace the social benefits as we know them in the current uh, welfare states. You give an amount to people and they can use it in several, um, uh, in whatever they, they wish. Uh, replacing all the benefits uh, they, they have. This is the radical view and probably this is an utopia and the more difficult probably to implement. Uh, and at the same time, I think that it, it will probably grant uh, opposition because you are changing, you are changing the, the, the pattern of the welfare state as we know, as we know it. And uh, the pattern of the welfare state uh, it, even in those more universal Nordic countries, you always have insurance. You, ha you always have some social risks with uh, an insurance, and people pay for that insurance, and you have the protection uh, when uh, the risk happens. So my question is, because you, you won't be able, I guess that you won't be able to implement this radical view, so you will have a second best option and I guess that the second, uh, get, uh, second option, second uh, option, mm, second, second optimum uh, is, is quite, it, 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 I feel a certain disappointment. So if we're not going to this uh, uh, radical view, what, what, what rests? Uh, my point is that um, look what happens in countries like Finland or, or um, Nordic countries, you have insurance for certain social risks, then you have a diversity of uh, social benefits, universal social benefits that are financed through income, th through tax uh, uh, income. So uh, basically we are replacing these uh, several uh, uh, benefits by one basic income that will uh, basically uh, develop the same function uh, financed through taxes and this is basically a strategy of simplification of the tax system 
you know. In, in order, instead of paying several benefits, you will pay just one. And it's basically a strategy of, of simplification. Um, and even in southern country, countries, more labor uh, type uh, uh, models, <coughs> you have uh, contributory benefits and non-contributory benefits. If you will leave contributory benefits as they are, financed through contributions, payroll taxes, then basic income, basically, what it will do? It will replace those uh, uh, benefits that are financed through taxes. And once again, what we will have, basic income, as a strategy of simplification and replacement, we have to use this word, of uh, what already exists. So my point is, if you can't have all, which is this radical view, because it is non-feasible in my, in my view, you will have only a process of simplification of the welfare state, replacing a huge amount of, uh, of course we have, and probably the, the system has grown up and it has become complex and, and it has dysfunctionalities, administrative dysfunctionalities and so forth, but in my view, I don't know if this second best solution is really uh, uh, a solution, is really something new, okay? okay. So uh, that was precisely what I tried to say. That, uh, we have lots of basic security schemes. Why not to put them together so that the persons doesn't need to run here, there, 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 just get this and that and that done. And virtually in the Finnish case, all of those benefits are about at the same level, but it's all traditions and there are lots of vested interests from different parties who are implementing or who has been favoring those different schemes. And when it comes to the full basic income, we did the calculations that, for example, in the case that we pay, would pay 1,000 euros a month to every uh, people living in Finland, in that case we had to collect the flat rate tax on top, or, or on income coming on top of that, uh, and the tax rate would be 70%. And in the case that the level would be 1,500 euros, in that case the tax uh, rate uh, would be 80%, and it would be totally impossible to propose to the Finnish population that uh, you will get basic income, but then there's a side effect, and the side effect, it's very small. It will be 80% taxation. But the, in the case that we have uh, 560 euros, in that case the tax level is something like 40%. That, uh, that is not that much different uh, what we are paying just now. So that I think that the, that was um, actually that was the reason why we thought, uh, thought that that uh, we will take this partial income for the experimentation because it's somehow possible to implement not that that full basic income. So that the, I very much agree what you said. You may no. disagree. No, no, I don't. I just want to add something to it. Uh, I never disagree with you, Oli. <laughs> you should know that now. <laughs> um, when you talk about simplification, I, I think it's very important to realize, I mean, in, in many ways that is what's happening, right? A lot of what basic income is about is what you call simplification. But here are two very, very different contexts. Think of what the UK is now doing with universal credit. They are simplifying the system by, you know, tagging a whole bunch of programs to each, basically along into one simple system. They utterly, utterly failed to figure out how to implement it, but that aside, um, the biggest problem is that they've used that basically to reinforce what they've been doing for a long, long time, namely make it more and more punitive conditional, right? So you don't have just simplification, you have simplification with punitive conditionality. Contrast that with simplification with unconditionality. And think about what that looks like from the person who has the sort of life where they move from one job to another and at times may need to have this sort of support, right? I mean, I don't think anyone who is struggling at the bottom of the labor market in the UK is going to worry about simplification. 
in that sense, in the unconditional sense. So, I mean, this is about real people, right? So. Yeah, I, I think that's a good summary. I mean, my, uh, I think my only point is about perspective here. It's, it's a good example. I don't think the problem is, um, you know, in, in itself that we need to look at basic income at some level as a technical problem. So we need to look how much cash is in state coffers, who are the different interest groups, you know, benefit and cost analysis. My warning and where we need, I think, much more critical conscience to interact with people like Holly, to interact with people who are at the centers who are doing the great work of pushing, you know, the conversation in practical terms, is that we cannot take for granted that these questions are apolitical. I mean, that's exactly what, you know, we went wrong with the EU and Brussels technocracy. We had the whole class of people who just sold to us in very convincing terms, you know, very well-educated people who have studied the things. Many of them are well-intentioned. There's no issue even about that. But we have depoliticized the issue as if there's only one way. So my critical question, question here is always to remember that there is a broader conversation. When we say there is no money, we need to look how much tax breaks are the rich getting. Where, are going, where the companies are going with the tax havens. When we say African states have no money, we have to look where the tax have run away, transfer pricing. So these are the questions, and that's why the basic income discussion is very political. The issue is not to be against a priori and say, no, 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 we need to cut all this, there's nothing good because you know, this is the system. It's to be inside and sustain this conversation, always to push that when we say top number of Portuguese or Finns need this, you know, what can we do better? How are we going to change the system, you know, within a democratic setup so that we can have more? And that's the question now. We need to discuss that. Otherwise, then, the depoliticization of the agenda means almost by default, and it's not all his fault or Jürgen's fault, that the neoliberals will win because that's their hegemony. It's not about, you know, where they stand. That is, you know, where we're starting from. So if we don't push that, it's almost for granted that we're going to go in that direction. Pergunta, penso que será a última, peço-vos que temos mesmo que fazer interrupção para almoço. Mas faz favor, muito obrigada. Hi, um, Milker Moreira, from the Institute of Social Sciences. Is it not? No? Está, está. Um, não, não consegue ouvir atrás? Um, ok, sorry. Right, um, so one comment and one question. Uh, the comment is, um, I think, Jürgen, your work is, as we discussed yesterday, it's, it's, I think it covers an important part, which is the economic argument for a basic income, right? And how, how can you justify that? I have more doubts on whether, because, and this is something that we can discuss later on, if whether the social investment paradigm is actually the one you can latch yourself on to justify a basic income. If I, if I were to do it, I would explore OECD and IMF are now toying with the idea of, of inclusive growth. Right, of how we can set up models of growth that are by themselves reducing uh, inequality. And the evidence says, and it's very strong evidence coming from the 70s, that one of the major drivers of growth is reducing inequality at the bottom. So I think you'd have a much more, more powerful argument to, to promote basic income based on that rather than the, the social investment agenda. Because the social investment agenda is about investing in skills. And if you're investing in skills, you then have to b talk about education premiums and how m much people want to invest and whether having a basic income will actually interfere with the, how people devise their strategies for getting the education premium. And that's, that's where then you get the trade-off of having a basic income. And if you're having a basic income diminishes your, your education premium, then it is, uh, you're working against your own objective. But my question is more general. So uh, in my earlier years, uh, I didn't have that much hair by then, but <laughs> I had a bit more hair uh, when I was looking at these issues of uh, basic income. And there was a fundamental contradiction to me in the whole movement and the whole idea. And 15 years onwards, it's still there. It is not clear to me when I hear you and whenever I speak all these debates about basic income, what is the key aim? There are two aims that people toy with and that might be interrelated but are fundamentally dis distinct in terms of their, their implications, economic implications, and what about 
the trade-offs in terms of unemployment traps, poverty traps. One is whether you want a basic income that promotes real freedom, i.e. real choice, right? That people can actually give up from the labor market. That was, that was Van Paris' book. People can drop off the labor market, actually nothing will happen, the economy will be self-sustained because people have a natural preference for work, so the economic argument. So then you can set up the, the, the basic income at a such level that labor market choices become irrelevant, okay? So you, people make that, their decisions about participating in the labor market independently of whether they're needed or So there's a lot of deep commodification based uh, basic income. And then you have the human dignity basic income, which is, okay, then we guarantee a uni more or less universal safety net, which given that it's universal and then that is basically about, mostly about human dignity, it will be a much lower level. So that allows us to, to advertise the idea of a basic income without getting to discussions about trade-offs and unemployment traps and property traps. Throughout these 15 years, the whole community has not, is in my view, and I haven't followed the debates very closely, but even within this, this small thing, it's not clear from, from you guys who sustain the idea of a basic income, whether, what is your aim? Is it real freedom? Is it promoting human dignity? Because that will really define how, how you set yourselves, how do we integrate this into welfare states, how do we explain the potential, the potential economical argument for basic income. So I, I wanted to know from you guys what, in your view, should be, should be the end of a basic income. Yes. If it's human dignity, you say set it up as a minimum income for If it's real freedom, then you have to set it up very close to the medium wage. Because then people won't, won't, be, won't be affected by the economic choice. Simple. Um, number two, right? Um, for, for two reasons. I think number two is important. And secondly, like you, I, I think number one is red herring. I don't buy any of these people who say uh, basic income gives you the freedom and the power to say no. And I'm actually currently working on several papers with Simon Birnbaum on exactly that. And, and I'm saying this knowing how controversial it is within the basic income movement because everyone keeps saying this. But if you look at the details, it actually doesn't work. Even more than that, there is, there is a risk that um, for all sort of slightly technical reasons, which I can't go into, but there is a risk that a basic income could become an exit trap. It looks actually, I mean, I mean, it would allow employers to use it as an unemployment subsidy and basically say, you know, you want to say no, be my guest, because I've been looking for a long way for a way to get rid of you. Thanks very much. That is a genuine issue, and it's a genuine issue in a context where you know we worry about labor costs, where automation is coming in as an alternative, and so on and so forth. So the people who use basic income as the power to say no, and also believe in the power of automation, I mean, they have a serious problem, I think. So, so I go totally on number two. I think the human dignity one is the one. A welfare state that traps people in a conditional, bureaucratic, nightmare stuff with full of error and literally treating people like shit because they happen to be needing social assistance. That is problematic for human dignity. That to me is the priority. But they are not contradicting. Yeah, they are. I think that, yeah, I agree with Amilcar. No. I think I agree with Roberto. I don't see the contradiction, to be honest. And sorry to take a bit of a critique. I think you did a very simulating question, but it kind of shows the original bias. So we're here to do this kind of first principle philosophy where actually we're talking about real world. So I think the contradiction between the two, I think you did a very good summary, but the contradiction is only logical. So in the realm of absurd philosophy. I think what's really interesting about the first, and that's why I don't see it in contradiction with the other, it's really looking at the real political economy. To me, the real hunch that people like Van Parijs had in the original formulation was understanding that actually the whole global system was going to become very much like the colonial system. If you study any labor market in Southern Africa, you would see that very clearly. Most people have never been formally employed, 
they were never meant to be formally employed, and they were exploited exactly on this separation. You know, the economic dualism, a la Arthur Lewis, was the most people, that was the main economic discrimination when we talk about racism, beyond just the symbolic issues. I.e., you are not worth, you become full, you know, working middle class citizens like in UK, in Italy, in Portugal, and elsewhere. So the problem of the Eurocentric bias here is very simple. In Europe, we're still attached to the idea that this model is universal. It never was. This was Europe after 45. So if we look at the real world now, beyond the issues of where we stand about racism and colonialism, beyond the morality of it, the practical data is showing that structurally, we are becoming much more like apartheid South Africa than apartheid South Africa is becoming like us. So we are going to, and sorry, I'm using strong metaphors just to make the example. We're going towards a world where most people have been made dispensable by the current economic system. So the idea of liberating, or at the same time, liberating yourself from the slavery, because our costs are becoming lower and lower. I mean, look at any kind of skilled work now, you know, where you're actually writing things online, or you know, doing academic consultancy or anything. It's very low. It's all been dumped already. That's a fact. And second, that's where the human dignity comes from. It means that we, we are not here to debunk work. We're not here to say, no, no, let's stop work. This techno-utopia stuff, I mean, it's not helpful. I really find it very unhelpful. Oh, yeah, let's wait for the robots so we're all going to get a basic income. It's, it's part of this kind of delusions, populist delusions that we're living in. And one understands where they come from. I'm not trying to discard the emotion behind it. But we need to be here to say, listen, this is not. But the idea of human dignity and liberating yourself from selling your labor, basic marks, you know, the compulsion to sell your labor, not the need, the wanting to work, or even the, the, the spiritual or emotional need. That is what we're going to face now. So what some of these visionaries saw in the 80s is now the reality. That's where basic income becomes a must in whatever form then we manage to negotiate how we're going to debunk a system that has already made us dispensable. This is not some revolutionary utopia. It's already happened now. So we can either go the old workerist way and say work is the center of everything, or we have to say we're not against work, we're not against the welfare state, but we need to reform this radically if we want to still catch most of the world population within this. Muito obrigada. Muito obrigada a todos. Voltamos a encontrar-nos às 14h30 para retomar os trabalhos. Obrigada.